I know what uh, many of you are thinking. Uh, finally, we get to the part of James uh, about taming reptiles and sea creatures. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. So some of you invited a friend for this. You fought marathon traffic. And let's get into some of the do's and don'ts. Um, just kidding. I was like, I'm going to go all the way with this. I'm going to make a chart for this joke. And so there we go. Uh, it's election week. I feel like I had a little leeway. Uh, it's Marathon Sunday. Congratulations on being here. Um, if you do want to talk about taming sea creatures and reptiles, let's get a coffee. Um, yeah, James said, don't let many of you become teachers. Uh, if you've been with us uh, for the rest of this exploration of James since, uh, since late September, uh, you'll note, listen, James is not letting up, uh, especially, especially here. Uh, he's coming out of the gate this morning going after teachers, uh, after how we use our speech, uh, after how envy and selfishness can make space for all other types of evil, um, how some things that masquerade as wisdom are actually demonic. It's really intense. Uh, James packs quite a bit into these uh, five chapters, and, and this section is no different. But uh, I just want you to know sort of like a little bit of the scope of, of where we are. As, as our team, uh, as our elders, we're praying for you. We're laying out what this, this fall would be about. Um, we thought it could be very powerful <laughs> On this week here, on November 3rd, uh, before the election, to have a Sunday on speaking peace. <laughs> Just what an appropriate thing to land on, on on this Sunday. And then after the election, next, next week, to have a week on humbling ourselves before God. <laughs> Uh, also, I think pretty appropriate. It, felt, it actually felt like God was directing us to some specifically important places for our moment in time. And then incidentally, uh, we'll have two more weeks in James and they will be on uh, God will set things right and patience and prayer. And, and all that will be uh, before we get to, to Advent. We've been saying that, that James uh, is this letter, it is, it is New Testament wisdom literature. So it's in the tradition of the Proverbs, of Ecclesiastes, of, of Job, Song of Songs, the Psalms. Um, it's direct. Um, there are times like this morning where it feels abrupt. Um, but it is meant to lead to and direct practical action in our lives. Uh, James is, is writing to people who are experiencing uh, profound resistance in their life of faith. There, there are many of, uh, of his recipients are struggling, experiencing pain, going through uh, times of intense persecution. Literally some of them, their lives are being threatened. James is, is a letter, it's something like, you could uh, read it like a, a field manual for difficult times. And if you think about it in that way, it's not like uh, just, just sort of trying to comfort you on the emotional level, it's literally giving you some practical tools for what comes up in challenging times and how to live those out and how not to exacerbate, to make it more difficult, to put you know, sort of fuel on the fire of our, of our difficulty and pain. James is also correcting some false notions, some patterns, some trends that had grown up around this new Christian faith. I want you to sort of, with our imaginations, just for a moment, consider this moment in the Jesus movement. It's, it's relatively new. James is the, the brother of Jesus ri writing this, which means he's still alive, which means we're only a short while, at most a few decades after the events of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. So this movement of Jesus is sweeping across the known world. It's going to transform the Roman Empire. That's a historical fact whether you believe in Jesus or not. That this small group of, uh, of Jewish believers uh, from this outpost corner of the empire changed the entire world by the message they shared and the way they lived. And so one of the really important parts of this growing movement would be teachers. People who could uh, speak to the message of Jesus and guide people in the way to live in difficult times as James is doing here. So the movement needs teachers, but there's also danger in that. That's what James is getting at. Don't let many of you become teachers. 
And actually, if you sort of look at the New Testament, bad teaching, bad teachers rising up in the momentum of the Christian movement to gain influence for themselves, it shows up in many of the New Testament letters. It's like a regular problem. Many of the letters we have were actually, it seems like the reason they were written was to be circulated to directly counteract some of the bad and false teaching that was, that was cropping up in the, in the early Jesus movement. James is giving us something of a litmus test for living the way of Jesus. How, what should you expect to be coming out of your life if your heart has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus? And so now it's a little bit like, man, I wish he was teaching us how to tame a lizard. <laughs> this is hard. This is difficult, right? He gives us a thesis early on, and then he expands on it. So in chapter 1 of James, he gives us this, this, this thesis that living in the way of Jesus must impact how you speak, how you treat the poor and the vulnerable, and how you adopt or resist the systems of the world that you are living in. That's, uh, th- these are like key spaces, James is saying, for the litmus test of whether our hearts have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus. How do you speak? How do you treat the poor and vulnerable? And how do you adopt or resist the systems of the world you're living in? So today... And it's quite a bit to, 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 take, to take on. But James is, is showing us that words have tremendous power. Words reveal our hearts and shape our lives. And then some clues on what to do when words have torn us apart. So that's where we're headed today. We're going to take each of those in turn. We'll get right into it. First, words have tremendous power. So as we've said, we've been saying James was Jesus' half-brother. Same mom, different dad. Check Luke 2. Uh, it's almost Advent. So we, he would have grown up as, as a Jewish boy immersed in Torah. And how does Genesis begin? It begins with God initiating creation by speaking. God speaks and it creates and shapes reality. Our God, whatever else our God is, our God is a speaking God. We are beings and we are beings made in God's image, which means our words also have power. The very first temptation in the scriptures, right away the power of words is coming through uh, with unbelievable uh, force to us. The first temptation centers around twisting what God had said. God's Word is the source of life. It is the initiation in creation. God's word is also the guide and the protection for this intimacy, for this relationship, for for human flourishing. And the first temptation that comes into the world is a twisting of, did God really say? Could God really have meant that? I once heard a mentor say exactly what I think James is getting at here. Our words have the power to create reality. Listen, words start wars. Words begin romances. They inspire hope. They damage psyches. They stir imagination. They they can unlock potential. And they can crush dreams. Uh, An unending criticism in the same place over and over can make life seem unbearable. Many of you would know that from experience. Living with unending criticism starts to make life feel like we have no place to live it. But, but also a few words of loving praise, of I see this in you, of speaking about someone's potential can unlock a new trajectory in someone's life. Our, our words have tremendous power to actually create realities in our world. There's a quote from Mark Twain in one of the English classes here in this school that says, the difference between the right word and the wrong word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Words can go deep into our souls. Words can shape our environments. Words can raise us up in confidence and words can disciple us in fear. 
Words and how, how they are spoken to us have, have a, a long-lasting implications uh, on our lives, on our upbringing. Some of you are spending a lot of time right now unpacking the words that were sown into your heart as a child. And the ways those words are, are finding an impact in, in your day-to-day life, right? This can happen in the, in the deepest, most profound ways. It can also sometimes happen in like a surface level. I, I saw... Um, <laughs> I shouldn't even get into this. My wife was like, no tangents today. We have no time for that. But there's a Seinfeld where Elaine breaks up with this guy and his previous like relationships like have tried to stab him. And one of them throws like soup on him in a restaurant. Like, what is this guy's deal? And apparently he's a bad breaker upper. And she's like, it can't be that bad. So she decides to break up with him before he can, you know, you know do this. And, and, and just all he says is, as they're breaking up is like, hey, you have a big head. It's too big for your body. And then he walks out. And at first she's like, yeah, is that all you got, pal? You know, very Elaine. It doesn't do anything. But then as the episode goes on, she starts to think about her head being big. And like a bird flies into it at one point in the episode. And, and she's like covering it with a scarf. And you see like it's, this, it's a joke. But it shows like this little seed of a word gets in your, in your head. And then it just replays in your insecurity over and over again. And all of a sudden she's like, my head is too big. Words can create realities. That was pretty quick, Allison. Okay, let's keep moving. Right? Words and how they are spoken to us, they can either keep our love or they can break our love apart. Right? We know something from uh, our own experience, how words shape the political environment of our time. This is an election week. Our words have the power to create reality. As friends, spouses, partners, uh, parents, children, colleagues, as neighbors, as enemies. Look at the metaphors James is stacking up here. You put a bit into a horse's mouth, a a a rudder on a ship, a a small spark that lights an entire forest. These are powerful things that are altered profoundly by something seemingly small. The words that come out of our mouths. It's not the same way that we see God initiating creation, but your words do have the power to create environments, to to shape the world that you're living in, to to change the reality of your home, to change the reality of a relationship. Our words have the power to create reality. And, 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 And another thing, our words have the power to describe reality. So I want you to think about that. How we get oriented into the world as human beings is we share words back and forth with one another to orient ourselves to what is real and what isn't, to how we're meant to live, and and, and, and to what is life and what is danger. And so when you use your words to mislead, it distorts reality. And it does it in a real and profound way for your neighbor. It changes, it ripples out across the the experience of our human community. It tears at the fabric. When we use our words to mislead, when we only tell the parts of the truth that benefit us, when we stay silent, when we should speak, that impacts the lived reality that we all share. We can use our words to distort reality. James is saying there's, there's a profound responsibility because of the profound implications There's kind of two primary ways the scriptures talk about us misusing words. And this is broad strokes and there's, 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 you know, you might find an example that's outside of one of these two. But the two primary ways is when we talk without love and then when we talk without truth. And those two things are profound ways human beings can misuse their words. And we do damage both ways. In fact, later in the New Testament, it's going to say... If you speak the truth, you speak what's accurate and factual, but you do it without love, it actually does harm. It's like you're like a racket, like a a resounding gong, like a clanging cymbal that that not only is it useless in the kingdom of God, but it actually does profound harm, right? To only speak the truth and not have love does damage, distorts reality, harms souls. If you speak truth, In love, without truth, it also does damage, right? It becomes this sort of like um, 
soft sentimentality that doesn't that does, doesn't hold up to how the world really is it's a, often a way that we manipulate one another we speak with with seeming kindness but without truth right and so these are the two primary ways the scriptures say we misuse our words one is that that we don't speak the truth and the other is that we we don't speak with love teachers are mentioned here i think because um, of the sort of accelerated example that they represent in 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 this um, without truth and without love, speaking does damage. And so how many times has someone like been led astray by someone confidently asserting something that was just a little bit off, right? And the trajectory start, you know, like if you leave LA on a plane and you're one degree off of the, of the flight path by the time you get to New York, right? You're actually in Charleston. And so like, it's a tremendous responsibility, James is saying, teachers will be judged more harshly. And I will say this is not my most favorite verse. But I think it does, and we don't have time to get into this concept in massive depth this morning, but um, I, I, I think it does raise the question, um, will Christians, will followers of Jesus be judged? Because, I, I mean... I thought the gospel of Jesus meant God's judgment was absorbed in Christ and we are made family with God and the gospel says that will never change. Nothing will snatch us out of his hand. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so absolutely, yes, we are adopted into the family. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so in that sense, we are, we are moved past the day of judgment. But the scriptures tell us, and they tell us this in multiple places, that there will still be an evaluation of Christian lives based on what we do with what we have been given. And that, that's an important thing that James is bringing up here. And, and, and I think one of the easiest ways to understand this is, in, is in, a, in a familiar context. If we pull this reality down into our human relationships, like when a loving parent disciplines a child, right? We're not deciding if the child gets to stay in our family. That's not the judgment that we're pronouncing. What we're saying is we're confronting what have you done with what you have been given. One of the regular like sources of conflict in my home is when an older teenager tells me that I'm not treating him the same as his nine-year-old brother. And I say, Absolutely, I'm not treating you the same as your nine-year-old brother. I expect you to do more with what you have been given. More, many more years of my teaching. Many more years of these terrible consequences for your behavior had they not changed your heart. I'm not deciding do you get to stay in the family, right? We're deciding what have you done with what you've been given. And Jesus says, and this is one of the most intimidating parts of the New Testament, Jesus says a day is coming when we will give an account for every idle word. I find that intimidating. The Apostle Paul says Christians will face a moment when it is revealed how they built with what materials they had in life. And that some people, the experience of that judgment will be like they built they barely come through and everything of their life will, will have been revealed as, as, as something not of the kingdom. And, and they will be, right? So there's these two pictures of judgment and the gospel says we are past one forever. We are adopted into the family, but we will still be evaluated for what we've done with what we have. The second thing James is saying is, is connected to this, but it's that words reveal our hearts and shape our lives. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. It's just the sea creatures that really get me. Um, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our, our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? Can a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fr fresh water. Our words reveal our hearts and shape our lives. Jesus said this utterly plainly. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
James is saying if you could somehow control what comes out of your mouth, you would be controlling your entire life. So, do we need self-control? Or do we need a change of heart? Yes. The answer is yes. If you try, like just as an experiment, try to go an hour a day a week without any negativity coming out of your mouth. Without, without, without complaining, without speaking a single negative word about another person, with letting your words uh, regularly be encouraging. Just take stock of what comes out of your mouth for the rest of today, for the rest of this week, right? And immediately you will start to see how challenging it is to exercise enough self-control that you regulate everything, even every idle word. And James is saying when you do that, what it will reveal is that we need a transformational change deep at the heart level. Now, I don't think we should cast off all restraint and never practice, you know, uh, willpower or self-control with our speech. That's not what this is saying at all. But it's saying when you get into doing that, it will reveal that we need change at the deepest levels of our heart, of our life, of our soul. Allison and I had really interesting kind of parallel experiences yesterday. Um, I've been getting my hair cut, as you see, I got a haircut yesterday. Um, I've been getting my haircut, thank you. Um, I've been getting my haircut by the same lady, Tatiana, uh, for 14 years. Here, you find someone you like, you stick with it, okay? It, it works. It's so nice not to have to think about that. You know, there's lots of other things to worry about. I go to Tatiana, I leave, and it's always the same, okay? Um, so in 14 years... Tatiana and I have never talked that much, okay? There's been a few times, uh, you know, like, uh, I, I won't get into everything, but we just haven't talked that much. It's like sort of we both sort of like just rest in the peace of the moment, you know? She's cutting my hair. I'm chilling. It's a nice time, okay? Yesterday, we sat down and we talked as much as we have in our entire 14 years. We both laughed about it at the end. I sat down and she was like, you're a priest, right? And I was like, sort of. And she just launched into it. She was like, I was an atheist my entire life until January 3rd of this year. And then I had an experience where I started, I was seeking God and I was changing my diet and I was praying and meditating. And I had this powerful revelation that God spoke to me and I realized I'm a part of all of it and God's a part of all of it. And, and she, began, she began to light up and she's going on, she's so animated. So I'm like, please do not cut my ear. And I'm looking at the other guys in the shop and I see them sort of like looking at me as they're walking by like, they've heard this before. And she just was like asking questions and, and, and asking my experience and recommending videos to me. It was literally like alpha in the barber shop. Amen. Let's go. Out of the overflow of her heart, it was like she just couldn't keep back sharing her experience and, and she was like, I had this profound change of my life for like two months. She said I was like on cloud nine. Everywhere I went, I was talking to God every second of the day. She said it started to dissipate some. She said, have you ever had an experience like that? And we're, we're, trading, we're trading stories. Literally the exact same time I'm at the haircut, Allison's at the playground with our youngest. And um, a woman, a stranger sits down beside her on the bench at the park. And just begins weeping. And this is a tough moment in New York City, right? Because we see a lot of humanity on the street. Sometimes someone walks by you, they're in a moment, right? They're, they're, they're pouring out tears and you're like, do I just give you your space? Do I do anything? What? So she, she said, I thought this was really beautiful. She said, you don't have to talk about it at all. But if you want to, you can. And the minute she sentence, finished that sentence, the woman just opened up and for like the next hour, absolutely pours out her heart about a breakup, about her ex. And she's telling Allison all the details. And I haven't been back to this neighborhood in, in a year. And I just decided to come by. And, and the person drove by right as I was coming up. And they were with someone else. And, and all the agony and all the pain and all of it just pouring out on this park bench. Out of the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks. And what it does is it reveals the inner reality of our experience. And, and, and we can cloak it. We can hide it. But when we do that, that when we're truthful about what's going on inside and we, and we let it out, there, there's a, a profound opportunity. We can 
share and give back grace, understanding love to one another, right? Whether if we kept that hidden, <laughs> that opportunity would be missed. And, and I was just thinking like, yeah, our words reveal what's going on in our hearts. James is saying that. So it's a, a kind of a litmus test for understanding ourselves. If we'll pay attention to it, our words also become the story that we live. Our words become the story that we live. The thing you say to yourself over and over again or the thing you let repeat in your mind and heart over and over again starts to become your reality, starts to become your character, starts to become your story. James is really intense a lot of times in this letter. Maybe nowhere more intense than when he says our tongues can be set on fire by hell. Our tongues can be full of deadly poison. Such an intense warning. You're like, that's, that's exaggeration. That's too much. What is he talking about? But I'm not, I'm not patting Allison and I on, on the back for our shared experience yesterday. But, but think about this. What if I said to Tatiana, ah, you're probably a little crazy. God doesn't speak like that. I bet, I bet the other guys in your top shop or tired of hearing this God talk. Could you just cut my hair and keep these things to yourself? Right? Can you just feel the harshness of that? Like what would that do to the environment? What would that do to her, her, her heart? What if Allison said to this woman on the bench, it seems like whatever happened to you, you probably deserved it. The damage we could do, right? And these are people that we never have to see again. <laughs> like I could get my hair cut. I will not. I could get my hair cut by someone else. These are people we never have to see again. What I want you to think about is, how do you speak to those you share the most intimate life with? How do you speak to your friends, your parents, your children? How do we use words? And James is saying, James is saying that our words can be animated by the power of the accuser. Jesus taught us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. James is saying you can use your words in such a way that it's like on earth as it is in hell. You can use your words in a way that it's like on earth as it is in hell. The power of accusation, the power of half-truths, the power of criticism, the power of sarcasm, right? We see this on display in our culture right now in our political moment. We can do such damage with our words. It's just like we poison them. We sow the seeds of the accuser. Like, look at any internet comment section, <laughs> right? The words we use with one another, like, it can become like on earth as it is in hell. This is as, as intense as it gets, but James is saying we can participate in these realities with the way we use our speech. And most of us know this from experience, but when you use words to harm someone, it always lives past that moment, right? You may have gotten it off your chest, gotten it off your mind, said what you feel like you need to say, and almost always those words live past that moment. They sow a seed, they sow an insecurity, they sow fear. They're like a poison, and you might not see the effect of it in the moment, but it will, it will show its head. Many of us have deep wounds from how words have been used in our lives and how we have used our words to others. And I just want to say before we get to the last point of the sermon, in a little bit we're going to come to communion and pray. And I just had such an impression in our pre-service prayer that, that there are, this is a day for healing. That some of you need to bring some wounds of your heart, some words that someone has spoken to you that have inflicted deep pain and injury and bring those to God and ask for healing. There, there's many in this room who have been wounded by words and you need to ask God for healing. And then also I think there's some here who you've used your words to inflict damage and we need healing as well. I, I really believe this is a, a mourning for, for healing in our church. And James says, and it's a little bit more cloaked than the first uh, two, but what, some clues about what to do when, our, when words have torn us apart. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show up by their good life, by, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, you find disorder in every evil practice. 
But the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Even if you just consider the two ways of life that are being compared here, this is what God wants for us to be these peacemakers who are sowing seeds of shalom. And seeing a harvest of righteousness. This is a new reality grow up that represents God's heart in a space. That you can sow seeds of forgiveness that grow up into reconciliation. That you can sow uh, uh, words of encouragement that grow up into renewed motivation and imagination in someone's life. That you can sow sow words of truth that correct a a lie that someone's been living with their entire life and all of a sudden they are more free than they were before. Those who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And what does it look like? It's pure, it's peaceable, it's considerate, it's humble, right? The the comparison is is wild. Which type of person do we want to be? And And the, and the, yeah. The world tells us that wisdom is, is to always defend yourself, is to always win, is to always triumph, is to always make, make the most of yourself. James has already s- sort of been telling us in this letter what to do, but here he says, he reminds us, if any of us lack wisdom, we should ask God who gives it to us freely. That's what he said in the very beginning of this letter. And here he's sort of comparing the earthly wisdom that, that our culture gives us and, and the, the wisdom of heaven. Ask God and it will be given freely. So this is where we begin. When we find ourselves having participated in damaging speech or having been damaged by speak, speech, we go to God and ask for help and then we expect God's help. Both of those things together are extremely powerful. Some of you know what it's like to ask for help and not expect it at all. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he will give you wisdom freely without reproach. It won't be like, ah, you don't deserve it. You haven't done quite enough good to deserve the wisdom you're asking for. Ask God for a change of heart. Ask God for a change at the deepest level of your heart, at the deepest level of your soul, right? Self-control is one thing, and often our best attempts at self-control in something like our speech will reveal that our problem goes so much deeper that we need a change of heart, that we need the prophetic promise that God spoke to Israel. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's how God describes the transformation that the gospel brings. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. They are part of this new creation coming on earth as it is in heaven. James puts this stark choice before us. We're either joining in God's way, being revealed in the world, or we're participating in envy and selfish ambition. And that holds every other evil practice. I'll give you a prayer. You can pray this. God hears my heart. Forgive me. Change my heart. If, if you find that you have done damage and you have been damaged by harmful speech, God, here's my heart. Forgive me. Change my heart. If I've been a salt spring, clean me out. If I've been a grapevine bearing fi- figs, will you change me at the deepest level? Some of you have tried to do Christian behavior change without ever surrendering your heart to Jesus. This is a gospel prayer. God, here's my heart. Forgive me. Change my heart. That might be your define the relationship talk with Jesus. Like, I finally want to come to the place where, where I've been trying and, and seeing my own you know, failings and falling. And I just want to say, here's my heart. Change my heart. I also want to say, you can say that if you've been a Christian for 25 years or 50 years. You can say that this morning. God, here's my heart. Forgive me. Change my heart. I want to ask you this week a prophetic exercise in our world. Pay attention to what shows up in your words. Pay attention to what shows up in your words. If you're a gatekeeper of your own mouth... Do you see consistent negativity or do you watch encouragement marching out? Are you catching cynicism or are you springing out hope? 
Do the people around you, this one convicts me, (laughs) expect words of anger or words of peace? And I'm like, I'm angry because I love. My kids and my wife are like, please, no. (laughs) Less of that, please. So I say, God, here's my heart. Forgive me, change my heart. When, with the gatekeeper of your mouth, uh, catch sarcasm going out to protect you from being vulnerable. That's sort of a, a, a subtle New York sophistication move, is that you never really care about anything, and you always keep yourself a little bit at a distance from everything. You never let anything really land on your heart because you've just seen it all. And so you kind of use sarcasm to protect yourself from vulnerability, but over the years what that does is it cages off your heart so you don't actually really experience intimacy because you don't really share who you are. And so you've made this little cage of cool and sarcasm and protects yourself and now you get cynical in this little cage of your heart. Are we vilifying? Are we running down those we disagree with? This week, could I work to recognize where someone that I I, I just can't understand and can barely stand where they might be coming from? Pay attention to what shows up in your words because the gospel and James and Jesus are saying it's, it's evidence of what's in your heart. I was working through this passage. I gotta be honest, right? I, I feel like James has been a punch in the throat every week. I was working through this passage at my office and I just texted my wife, I would like to apologize for all the words I've used since September 20th. So I'm covered, basically. (laughs) It's a sin, retail, confess, uh, uh, a wholesale situation. Pay attention to the words that show up in your life. And then with God's help, this passage ends saying, use your words to sow seeds of peace. That as much power as your words have to do damage, your words can also sow seeds of peace that will, according to the promise of God, grow up into a harvest of God things. That's what righteousness is here. Grow up into a harvest of God's character revealed, God's forgiveness shown, God's mercy demonstrated, God's justice done. Sow seeds of peace, sow sow seeds of shalom, and it will grow up in your world. We don't have time for all that we could say about this, but the last 75 years have been a period of the, of the most rapid change in human history. <laughs> in 1960 was the first televised public presidential debate, Kennedy and Nixon. And, there's, you know, and you probably learned this in history, right? Those who listened to the debate and those who watched the debate had very different understandings of the results of that debate, of who won. <laughs> And in the last 75 years, our communication has changed as much as it ever has in the history of humanity. It is, this is an, an epoch level, uh, new era type of transformation, right? The spike of development. How we interact with words has changed. And, and one of you can write the book on how we went from cave paintings, hieroglyphics, to Shakespeare in, in thousands of years. And then how we went from Toni Morrison to emojis in like 50. And now you can answer a real question with just the word K. That's like 50 years. took thousands to get from cave paintings to Shakespeare. From Toni Morrison to emojis was like 50. What's happening? Let's consider this, though, when we think about peacemaking. And before we get into this, I just want to say as we're closing, God chose for you to be alive in this time. God chose for you to be alive in this time. God's not wringing his hands saying, I can't believe you're having to face this. I can't believe this is the moment you're alive in. One of the more dominant forms of communication in our day, in our time, is extremely short form video that gets voted up or down the algorithm based on the intensity of reaction. And because of that, if stuff gets voted up or down the algorithm of our timelines based on the intensity of reaction, you know what that doesn't make very much space for? Peacemaking speech. What we need is 
jarring speech, speech that elicits like uh, intense reaction, speech that captivates by how divisive it is, right? And so uh, we may be burning up in inflammatory speech because what's shocking gets shared and bumped to the top of our timelines. And also what becomes shared the most then is a vehicle for advertising. And so becoming a nozzle of controversy can get you paid, can make you famous, can give you influence. It's a challenging time for peacemaking speech. And God chose you to, for you to be alive at a time like this. So there's space to lament how difficult that is for sure. But I think there's also space to say, how has God equipped you to be a peacemaker? How has God equipped you in this time, in this election week, to be a peacemaker? To make a difference with how you show love through how you speak. I think that's a thing worth considering. I think James has invited us there. Pay, pay attention to what shows up in your words. Ask God for help, for a change of heart, and sow seeds of peace. There's a promise associated with that. You will reap a harvest of God's reality revealed. God, will you help us by your Holy Spirit? I really in particular want to pray for healing, God, in our hearts and minds for those who have no, they've been sort of like really sensing a wound since we first began speaking about it of, of ways that words have damaged their heart, damaged their mind, damaged their soul. God, some of them, some of us, those, those words sown in us have grown up into anxiety, have grown up into, to, to, Tension in our mind and heart and body have grown up into despair and depression, have grown up into uh, insecurity on repeat in our heart. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would do the work of, of, of rooting out, of plowing up some words of, of poison that have been sown in our hearts. And you would do the work of healing us. And I also want to pray for healing for those who have sown words of, of discord and, and despair and discouragement, who've done damage with their, with their speech. I pray for healing. I pray for mercy. I pray for forgiveness. I pray for another way. And I ask as we come to the table of communion, may we be nourished by your grace this morning. May we become people of your grace of your peace. We sow seeds of that shalom. In Christ's name, amen.